tonight we're going to talk about invasive species. And um, I kind of took a little bit of a different slant on this. I know earlier this week, Vicki did a really awesome talk, really in depth on murder hornet. Um, tonight I'm going to talk a little bit more about invasive species, what they are, um, kind of how we detect them, follow up, what you do if you find one. And I'm going to gloss over some of um, probably some of the more important ones that we've seen and just give you different types of examples of invasive species because not all invasive species are here um, in the same manner. Some come in accidentally, some are brought in on purpose and things like this. So we're going to kind of cover the histories of a few of our more major ones. So with that, I'll get started. So, you know, what comes to mind when you hear the term invasive species? For most people, this conjures up things like they're bad, they're destructive, not wanted, and there's other things that come up with that as well. Um, you know, and when we talk about destructive, this is because a lot of times they come in and they are usually found where they're damaging trees or crops or becoming a major structural pest. And um, sometimes they're even a big health threat. So. Um, these are the kinds of things that really catch the attention in the media. For example, everybody I'm sure has heard about murder hornets, especially after Vicki's wonderful talk earlier this week um, and the publicity it got, even though it's in a very, very small corner of the Northwest United States and ha probably has years to go before it really spreads out of even Washington state. Um, it caught the national media attention very quickly. And suddenly across the country, there's people going, Oh no, what about my honeybees? Since they learned that they will attack honeybee hives and what, you know, what do I do? And then everybody's turning in um, samples of things like cicada killers and other insects that look similar, but are not murder hornets. And it just causes a lot of confusion when some of these things get a little bit sensationalized um, because, you know, we really don't know the extent or how quickly they could spread, but, you know, even here in Kansas, we're getting a lot of these questions. Um, you know, what do I do? How do I protect myself from murder hornets? And they're not even a problem here. So, um, you know, it's those types of things that with invasive species and the way the media kind of can sensationalize or make something that's just a really local problem seem like a big deal um, that it can kind of really get blown out of proportion very quickly. On the other hand, some of these invasive species can spread very rapidly before we even realize they're a problem. And by the time we start looking for them, they've gone to a much larger area than we realize. And emerald ash borer is one example of that, where when they started looking, they thought it was in a certain area, only to find out that because of their life cycle and how they damage trees, they had to go like five miles out in a radius just to figure out where they all were, because they were already there. Um, so some of these we detect really quickly, others take a long time to really figure out and delineate where they are. So what is an invasive species? Um, according to USDA, uh, an invasive species can be plants, animals, or other living organisms, um, including microbes and others, that uh, basically are in an area where they don't belong, or they're out of their native range, or they've come in from another country. Um, things like that. And in Wikipedia, it says an invasive species is an introduced organism that negatively um, impacts or affects its new environment. Um, so those are the kind of the general definitions, but then each species kind of has its own um, set of rules that it follows really once it's introduced. And a lot of that is because when they come in, they're in a new environment trying to figure out where they fit in. Um, some may come in and never really do much or survive because they just can't find maybe their native plants that they like. But if they are successful, they will adapt to uh, new species and new environments uh, where they're uh, just planted or where they end up. So another question that comes up sometimes is, you know, how many uh, invasive species are there in the United States? Um, so I looked this up on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and it says, although the numbers vary widely, some of the current research estimates that there are approximately 50,000 non-native species in the United States, which is a lot. But that, again, that includes everything, not just insects, but weeds, um, pathogens, and many other things, you know, mollusks, fish, you name it. Um, 
you know, so however, you know, only 4,300 or, you know, 4,300 have been considered invasive. Um, some things that we do have in the United States that uh, technically would have been an invasive species at one time would have been honeybees. And we don't consider that an invasive species. It's not native to the United States. It was brought in with the colonists. And in fact, the Native Americans at the time called them the white man's biting flies. Uh, they were really not liked very much. But, you know, when colonists and things come over, they bring the things they're familiar with and having honey and bee production was one of those things. And they then spread throughout the United States. So the next several slides is um, just a list of invasive insect species from North America. So you can see there's going to be a wide variety of these insects. Um, and the ones that I've highlighted in yellow are some that we're gonna talk about here coming up. So um, things like the Asian tiger mosquito, this is one that uh, was introduced uh, within the last 40 years. Um, Africanized honeybees is one that used to be, you used to hear a lot more about in the media, but not so much anymore. Um, things like small hive beetle, that affect honeybees uh, have been widely covered because of the devastating effects that it has on beehives. Um, emerald ash borer, um, I just talked about that briefly. It was originally detected in Michigan, and this is one that does affect us in Kansas. In fact, every year um, when we go to the Kansas State Fair, one of the things that we use state fair collections for is to look at the insects that US 4 Hers have collected and try to determine which of these species is, you know, here. Uh, some of the main ones we look for are Japanese beetle and emerald ash borer because we know we have both of these in Kansas, um, but they occur just in certain areas or certain counties or in like little pockets. Some Japanese beetle will be like in two or three counties and not known to um, exist outside of that area. So when we go and we look for these and we see them in your collections, because yes, we have found them in your collections, um, we take note of what counties you collected them in and then we go back and we work with the Kansas Department of Agriculture because they do surveys on this every year. And we say, hey, this 4 h -er has this found from this county. And actually this is how we found some county records in Kansas is because of your collections. Um, but to, to some, you know, 4-Hers, you find something like a Japanese beetle. It's just a really pretty shiny green beetle that looks really cool. And so you don't always realize that what you're collecting is an invasive species, but um, it has helped the Kansas Department of Agriculture learn where we have new species in the state. Um, so, you know, it, you guys are really helpful on that um, front too, and you don't even know it. So like I said, these are some others. Um, I also wanna to touch here on like the exotic leaf roller moth. This is one that the USDA will trap for on a regular basis um, with annual trapping. They, they trap for many different things, but if there's uh, larger fruit orchards in the area, that's one that they set out pheromone traps for and try to detect. So some things are going on all the times in the background. And one of the things that I just want you to think about um, as we're talking about some of these invasive species. So we're talking about the Kansas Department of Agriculture, the USDA, um, that uh, the definitions from the uh, Fish and Wildlife Services. These are different areas that you can think about if you're really interested in entomology and becoming an entomologist. These are the different types of jobs that are also available out there. Um, most of the jobs in entomology, if they're not in research and teaching, are actually in this kind of regulatory work where you're safeguarding the United States from invasive species. So we're gonna look at some more here. Um, things like silverleaf whitefly is a, a greenhouse pest. Um, there's several other Formosan subterranean termites. This is a big one down in Louisiana, especially the New Orleans area that has damaged some dikes so severely that they've had um, to be careful about monitoring the dikes around that area for failures in case um, they break through and flood an area of New Orleans. And then uh, we're going to talk about a Asian lady beetle. This is also known as the multicolored Asian lady beetle and it has a kind of a neat history of how it was brought in. 
the brown marmorated stink bug. This is one that the Kansas Department of Agriculture is currently monitoring for throughout the state. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, also, uh, the spotted lanternfly, I'll cover that one. I'm just going to mention here the Argentine ant. This one is one that came in as a um, as an invasive species, but has spread. And uh, this one actually not only has become a homeowner and a structural pest. This ant, if if you leave a a shipping trailer sit long enough, will create nests and get up into the semi trailers and get shipped across the country. So it's almost everywhere now, just because of how it acts. And in my job as um, as an entomologist right now, uh, this is one of the ants that we receive regularly to identify uh, just because it does hitchhike so readily in trailers. Um, and again, pharaoh ant, this is another one that is a structural pest. It's the third one down from the top. Um, pink hibiscus mealybug is one that nursery stock inspectors have been uh, on the lookout for throughout the country to prevent its spread. So you can see there's a lot of different insects here and there's uh, just a lot of things to know about all of these. But if you were working in regulatory, you would know kind of what's a threat in your area, what could potentially move around. Like I mentioned, nursery stock inspectors, they're made aware of some of these things that may be moving on nursery stock or in sod. And then they're uh, made, let known to work for it, uh, to look for those. And in some cases, if a nursery sends out a shipment and it's detected somewhere, then they send out a notification saying, hey, you might want to take a look and see if any of the nurseries that receive stock from such and such nursery um, arrived in your state and kind of do what we call a trace back, where you try to go to the point of it's been delivered. Now, can we figure out if these are the plants and where these plants have ended up? Sometimes that's doing? very difficult. What are we doing? What do you mean, what are we doing? Um, like, what are we talking about? Oh, invasive species. Oh, okay. Thanks. Okay. Yep. Sorry about that. I was, uh, I wasn't here at like 13 minutes ago. Okay. <laughs> so uh, in addition to, to insects, um, a lot of times when we're looking for insect invasive species, arachnids, which are things like spiders and ticks and mites also get lumped in with insects. So some of these um, also uh, are considered invasive species, but they're not necessarily the type of things that everybody thinks about. So um, things like honeybee tracheal mites is one that you would never see or be able to collect in the wild, but they kill honeybees. So you really have to not only have the dead honeybees, but you have to be able to dissect the honeybees airways, the tracheals are the airways or the pipes and these little mites live inside the honeybees uh, airways. Um, and so these are very difficult to detect and doing the dissections to uh, detect them are very tricky. So, you know, and then one that everybody has heard of is the Varroa mite. And those also attack honeybees, uh, but this is one of the largest mites out there and it's very easy to see with the naked eye and collect. But then these are not insects, so we don't put them in your 4-H collections. So, okay, you've seen there's a whole bunch of different invasive species out there. So how do they arrive in the United States? Some are accidental um, arrivals. So what they do is they come in uh, every day at our ports, we get ships, we get trains that move around the United States plant material that moves from state to state. Some comes in from other countries. Things like cut flowers will come in from other countries. And when they come in, they are inspected at all of our major ports. We have inspectors that are there from either Homeland Security, the Department of Homeland Security, or the United States Department of Agriculture uh, from a unit called APHIS. It's uh, the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, and the division is called Plant Protection and Quarantine, or PPQ. So what they do, and they're also at airports as well, they inspect um, incoming goods on ships and trains. 
at airports, they inspect international flights, people's luggage, the food, the snacks that they're bringing in for um, invasive species. And then they, if they find these invasive species, they can hold up a shipment. The problem is, is we get so much coming into this country every day that even with all of the inspectors out there, we only really usually look at about 2% of incoming goods. So there's a lot of chance, it's a 98% chance that whatever's coming into the United States is not being looked at. How they decide what to look at is based on the level of threat that they perceive that a product or a good has. And the other part of that is that um, things that are coming in like plant material is very high risk. So those are the ones that kind of get looked at is those things that when they look at the shipping uh, logs and what's coming in, they decide what is high risk, what's medium risk and what's low risk. And so they really focus on that high and medium risk um, levels. Um, another thing that um, has happened in, in the past, I have been a nursery stock or a plant protection specialist uh, for the Missouri Department of Agriculture, it was my first job out of graduate school. Um, you know, like I mentioned, when these things come in, they rank them as to the level of risk. There are things that get through there that they don't always realize have plant materials or things that could be high risk. For example, one time we had to go look at artificial Christmas trees that had been delivered to craft stores. Well, what they didn't know when it was listed as artificial Christmas trees is that the trunk of the tree was actually a real cedar log. And so within those cedar logs, then they had some cedar longhorn beetles emerging out of them in storage waiting for Christmas time for them to be put on display. And that one was an invasive species from uh, China. So um, sometimes these things get through the cracks at the ports because they just don't have time to look at everything. And in that ranking, they don't always find everything that could be potentially high risk. Another way invasive species have arrived in the US is that way back when in the 16, 17, 1800s, colonists and people who were just starting to do international type travel um, would bring them in on either their livestock that they brought with them, uh, the movement of some of their traded goods, things like, you know, the spices that they exchanged or shipped in. Um, and stored products are a great example of this. And when we talk about stored product pests, we're talking about pests of basically cereal grains. So things that are going to attack your harvested corn and soybeans, rice, um, herbs and spices and things like that. So it's food products. And, you know, most of our stored product pests that we have uh, have an origin somewhere in the world, but anymore, um, they're distributed almost equally throughout the United States. We have one stored product pest that is a quarantine pest in the United States, and it is the capra beetle. And we don't have it established here yet, but it is established in many places of the world. And when I mentioned earlier that inspectors are at the airports, uh, inspecting people's food and snacks as they come into the country. This is one of them that they encounter daily uh, from international travelers. Uh, so if, if it was to say get established or be found established in one area of the country, then the local state uh, entomologist or plant protection office, in addition to the United States Department of Ag, the APHIS PPQ folks uh, would set up surveys and try to contain it and hopefully eradicate it if it's possible. Um, and some of the invasive species arrivals in the US are on purpose introductions. Some of them don't go as planned. For example, one of them I'm going to talk to you about that you're very familiar with probably are, is a biological control agent. Um, biological control, if you don't know, for especially some of our younger folks, um, is when we use a bug that's considered a good bug that eats or kills a bad bug um, that's considered a plant pest or something. Um, and sometimes these biological controls, when, we, when they're actually sometimes brought in by the United States Department of Agriculture to help with a pest on a crop or something down those lines, but then over time, its populations grow and it, it becomes a, a structural pest or a health-related pest or something like that. 
They try to run all biological control agents through a lot of tests to make sure that they're very specific and don't have a lot of alternate hosts because one of the best biological controls that you can get in is very specific to what the, that they want either, you know, if they're a predator, what they want to eat, or if they're a parasite so that they don't um, yeah. affect endangered species or um, other things. You don't want them to uh, affect endangered species. You don't want them to get non-target species or species that are threatened. So they try very hard to make sure that they have a very narrow uh, food range when they are brought in, but that doesn't always happen. Okay, so the first one we're gonna talk about as an invasive species is the multicolored Asian lady beetle. Um, this is one of those biological control situations that didn't quite go as planned. It was originally brought in from Asia by the USDA back in the 1960s, and actually some reports say that it was brought in continuously from the 1960s through the 1980s. It was introduced for biological control of aphids. They also feed on similar insects, such as mealyworms or mealybugs. I should say mealybugs, aphids, stocids, and other different small little insects. Primarily the larval forms are very predaceous, but over time it really took hold. It spread throughout the United States in the 1990s and the early 2000s. Um, if it's out in your garden or in your yard, it's still considered a biological control or a beneficial insect. Um, because it's controlling some of those bad pests on your plants. However, in the fall of the year, these things need to find a place to overwinter. So when they're looking for a place to hang out as adults over winter, they congregate in very large numbers. In fact, it's kind of a really unique phenomenon. Um, they, they kind of, it's almost looking, looks like bees swarming. They start zinging through the air and congregating and you just see thousands of them flying in an area. And when they do that, then they, they uh, when they have the structure that they're gonna enter, they land on the side of the structure. Bees tend to typically go back to the same structures year after year after year. So if you find them in your home or in a certain building, they're probably coming back every year. And then in the spring, they try to get out again. So then you may find them in dead piles in your windows or near your doorways where they're trying to get back outside in the spring. However, the problem with these is, is not only is it a structural nuisance type pest because you have you know, hundreds or thousands of lady beetles in your house, they can also bite. Typically before multicolored Asian lady beetles, nobody thought lady beetles bit. They were, you know, when, when we first started getting these reports and people were saying these ladybugs are biting me, we all, as entomologists, our first thought was, nah, they can't be doing that. Um, but within a short period of time, we were learning, yes, they do. Um, and then also for some people, if their house is heavily infested, um, they can be an allergy issue. They do have a smell. And for some people, they have literally had to move from their homes because their allergies to these are so severe that they had to just pick up, move, and find a new place to go to and hopefully have a, a home or a structure that does not have these in them um, so that they are not affected. Uh, one, time, one year at the Entomological Society of America meeting, there was a whole symposia on these um, beetles and the problems that they are for people in terms of allergies. Um, another one then is emerald ash borer, and this one is a really pretty green beetle. Uh, some of you over in Northeast uh, Kansas may have seen this one. It, this is what it looks like. They're narrowly elongated, bright green in color. This is a more recent invasive species for us. Like I said, it was originally found in Michigan uh, back in 2002. And so, with this pest, there are state quarantines in place. So what that means is versus the multicolored Asian lady beetle where it's pretty much everywhere, nobody, the states aren't really doing anything about it. It's just there and you deal with the fact that it's a problem. For emerald ash borer, there are state quarantines in place so that you can't um, move plant material or especially wood that's been cut down like dead wood because you don't know why it died 
Um, and so this insect really spurred the don't move firewood campaigns or the burn it where you buy it campaign uh, for campers because one of the major ways that this insect has spread to new pockets in the United States is somebody has some firewood in their backyard and they take it and maybe if they were from Michigan, maybe they went camping in Colorado and they took their own firewood. And when they, if they didn't burn all the firewood and they left it there, then that firewood could have had these beetles emerge out and then you start a new population. And this is how some of our pockets in the United States have popped up as new invasive species sites. So they originally arrived in the United States as what they call buried in packaging material. Um, if, if you're a regulator, they usually say it was in the dunnage um, of, of a shipment. So sometimes with some of these cargoes that come into the United States, whether it be in ocean containers or on train cars to keep stuff from shifting around, they just fill it with extra stuff. And it's sometimes things like broken pallets and wood debris. And that's where these beetles um, have, have come from. So then in the map here on the bottom right, you can see where the emerald ash borer is confirmed in the United States. And that's the dark green color. The lighter green colors um, has state information strategies, but they're, they're looking for things and they're still doing survey work and stuff down those lines. Now, just because you see an entire state colored dark green doesn't necessarily mean that it's in every county in that state. So in Kansas, ours is mostly in eastern Kansas right now, and they continue to do ongoing surveys to detect which counties have it and which counties do not. So this is one where it, it's kind of county by county, and each state can either quarantine their entire state or they can have certain counties that are quarantined and not the entire state. Um, this is another newer one from probably just, I don't, didn't find the exact year that it came in, but I know when it, four years ago when I was with the, uh, the Great Plains Diagnostic Network, which is one of the entities, uh, one part of the National Plant Diagnostic Network, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. This was a new arrival within the last year or so before I left that position. Um, this is a really neat hemipteran. It looks like a super huge leafhopper. Um, it's not a fly, like even though it's called a lantern fly, it is not a fly, it is a hemipteran. So it's more related to plant hoppers, leaf hoppers, and that family. Um, th this is mostly a problem out east. It is a quarantine insect at the county level. Um, right now out east, um, this is the state of Pennsylvania. And you can see the purple is where it is. And then the, they get into the blue where they're doing surveys and quarantines. There's also a little bit down into certain counties in Virginia where there's just an isolated county or two where they found it. The quarantines here are severe. Um, what they do is they, they are not allowing vehicles to move out of county uh, areas. So if there is somebody that wants to ship something from one of these purple counties, they have to have somebody trained who is the person who signs off on the quarantine paperwork, who says, I have inspected this truck. I have found no, no uh, spotted lantern fly, no egg masses, um, no nymphs, no nothing. So they've looked over the entire thing. They've signed off and said, now it's good to go because I've done this inspection. Um, so it's very tight quarantine right now. I also know from some requests that we've gotten from some of our clients out in Pennsylvania, that the United States uh, Department of Ag, APHIS PPQ that we talked about earlier, um, is actually doing surveys. So they may come onto your property and they're gonna mark trees. They're actually setting up what they call a trap tree where they damage the tree to lure in the spotted lantern fly um, they'll lay their eggs in it, and these trees will also be treated with insecticide to hopefully kill them um, outright. And some trees will actually, once they lay their eggs and um, are done getting kind of wrapped up for their life cycle for the season, these trees will be cut down and burned so that hopefully we have fewer spotted lantern flies than going into the next generation. And that's what we call an active delineating survey. And that, so that's what they do is when they set up these trap trees, what they call a trap tree, and they go in and do heavy spraying. You 
since it is a regulatory action, the property that this is done on, the homeowner or the company doesn't really get a say in it, it's going to happen because they are trying very hard to limit the spread of this insect because it is so damaging. One of the reasons it is so damaging is because it is a large insect. Like I said, it looks like a plant hopper or a leaf hopper, but it's about an inch long. So it's very large compared to what we're used to seeing. And it is a horticultural pest. So some of the stuff that it can do on trees is cause oozing sap, wilting, leaf curling, and tree dieback. Um, it also, uh, as it feeds, if you're familiar with aphids and mealybugs and that family exudes or basically poops out honeydew. Um, and honeydew is a thick sugary liquid. And after it sits on the tree for a while, it actually turns black with, it'll get a mold on it called sooty mold. And that blackness does not allow for the tree to get sunlight and grow properly. And so eventually that can cause secondary death in the tree. And what it does is it can cause either um, stunted growth or again, it can cause tree dieback. Um, another one invasive species uh, is the Africanized honeybee. This is another one that kind of struck a lot of fear in people when the media got a hold of Africanized honeybee. Uh, they are more aggressive than our what we call our European honeybees. And you can't tell the difference between the two just looking at them. So they look almost the same. They're slightly different in size. The Africanized honeybees are supposed to be slightly smaller in size, but to you and I just looking at them, you really can't tell a difference. Um, so if you suspect that you have Africanized honeybees, the USDA Hayden Bee Lab in Arizona is the official identifying lab for these. Um, what they do is they take measurements. These are called morphometrics and those are used for the official identification. So they measure the wings and the wing cells and different parts of the bee's body and make a determination. These actually invaded the United States by natural movement. They came up through from South America and you can see the map on the lower right where all that black is, is where Africanized honeybees are known to occur. So they started off kind of down here in lower um, South America and they can move just through natural movement, swarming and flying uh, two to 300 miles per year. They can also, if a swarm catches a ride, say on a semi truck or other vehicles moving around, they can move that route also very easily. Um, right now in the United States, most of them are hybrids with European bees and DNA testing may be performed to tell you what percentage they are. Um, and DNA testing is really great with these because a lot of the, the, the test that is used for these is uh, mitochondrial DNA and mitochondrial DNA um, is maternal. So it goes down through the mothers. And as you know, um, most beehives are mostly females. The only ones that are not are the drones. Um, so most all of your workers and the queen are all females. So that's why it's a very effective method for testing. Um, several years ago, and I'm gonna say like 10 years ago, Kansas was actively testing and looking for capturing Africanized honeybees, clear back to before 2010. Um, at that time, my job, I was the honeybee specialist for Kansas. I was a faculty member in the entomology department at Kansas State University. And we were following what was going on in Oklahoma because they were moving north. If you look at the map on the bottom, um, of the state of Oklahoma, this is, they are actively testing. And what they do is they ask no questions. If somebody calls and complains or thinks they have Africanized honeybees, they take a sample and they kill it. No questions asked. They don't wanna risk that it is Africanized. Um, so then they take it back to the lab. They may send some off to the Hayden Bee Lab. And then they also do uh, DNA testing. Um, at the time, Oklahoma State had offered to do some DNA testing for us in Kansas if we needed it. Um, when I was in that position, we never did utilize that, but we did have a few samples that we did send to Arizona for testing. Um, in the last couple of years, these top two counties with the orange are positive. Um, 
prior to just a couple years ago, all of these top tier counties were gray, meaning that if they sampled them and they tested them, they were negative for Africanized honeybee gene. The white counties are ones where they have not had samples yet taken. So gray means they've been tested and they were negative. Orange means they were tested and came back with positive Africanized honeybee genes. Um, at one time, Oklahoma State University Diagnostic Lab was in conflict a little bit with the Hayden Bee Lab because the Hayden Bee Lab um, had determined some other populations were European and they had tested them with the DNA in the lab and the DNA said that they had a percentage of Africanized honeybee gene. So sometimes this can be a little bit confusing, but if they're really hybridized with our local European genes, they may have had enough European genetics in them that they were the slightly larger sizes by morphometric measurements, but the DNA will still pick up a very, very small percentage of Africanized honeybee genes. So, you know, sometimes our, our DNA methods are more precise than what we're going to get physically with an insect. Um, gypsy moth is an interesting example that I threw in here for our invasive species because this one is an insect that's been in the United States since the late 1860s. But yet if you look at the map in the upper right hand corner, you can see it hasn't spread very much at all. In fact, you know, you get it here into kind of the upper Midwest, but most of it's in the Northeast United States and it has remained there for over 150 years. So, you know, this was an insect that was brought in from the country of France by E. Leopold uh, Trouvelot. And what he wanted to do is to study insects with silk production. He was looking for better methods of silk. Um, the insects accidentally escaped from his home in Massachusetts and then became established in the wild around that area and continued to spread. Um, this is a quarantine pest at the state level for many states, so not county by county. If they find it in the state, it is quarantine. Um, they're not just trying to keep it to a, a little one area of the state. So if this one is found on nursery stock or trees that move into Kansas, it becomes a quarantine and eradication program, trying to get rid of it. It is primarily a pest of horticultural um, trees especially deciduous trees. Deciduous trees are things like our oaks and maples and things, you know, not, not evergreens. Um, and it is a nuisance pest from the point of the irritating hairs on the caterpillars. Um, these can cause skin rashes. If you look at the caterpillar in the top, these little hairs, if you get them on you, can cause a skin rash or maybe a burning sensation. Um, also, what we call the frass mess. These occur in very high numbers when they're out. And so, you know, it's, it's frass is caterpillar poop or bug poop. And so the frass or the mess that they make from feeding can be just a nuisance because it can cause problems on sidewalks and things like that. Um, so if they're in a homeowner's area, they're constantly sweeping off sidewalks or uh, trying to get the droppings off of their cars or whatever is underneath the trees that the caterpillars are feeding on. Um, so when you consider how long this pest has been in the U.S., it really has had minimal spread um, versus some of the un other insects that we've talked about, like multicolored Asian lady beetles only introduced in the 1960s, and it spread completely across the country. Um, Asian tiger mosquito. This is one that uh, is also a very recent um, introduction, you know, all things considered into the United States in 1985. It came in at one of those ports in Houston, Texas in a shipment of used tires from uh, Southeast Asia. So it was came in on a ship and we had another entry in California on what they called lucky bamboo from China. So it came in um, on some plants. As you know, bamboo can be hollow and have water sitting in it. And so some of those plants had that water and the mosquitoes had laid their eggs in it. And that's how it um, came over in these bamboo plants. This one is really a health concern because it can transmit things like yellow fever, dog heartworm, so it becomes a veterinary problem with your pets. Uh, encephalitis, this is a disease that can cause things like brain swelling. Um, Zika virus, which was 
really big in the news um, just a few years back um, and others. Um, one source said as many as 30 diseases can be vectored by this mosquito. So that gets kind of scary. So this is one that is now found in about 30 states in the United States. And you can see the map um, down here in the lower right hand corner from uh, the Department of Entomology at Florida. And so this is some of the survey work going on. Um, and you can see a few of these little blips over here in California, but California is doing their own monitoring. And so their distribution shows about four or five counties down here in Southern California where they're having uh, the biggest problem. The great thing is, is if you have a really tight isolated um, introduction like this, where it's just a few counties, what they're trying to do is trying to eradicate this in this area. That's not always an easy thing to do because you know these insects fly, they're small, they can get into a lot of waterways and into a lot of small places so they can be hard to detect. But if they can keep it contained and uh, put a lot of pressure on treating waterways and standing water and get homeowner buy-in for dumping standing water so that the mosquitoes don't have opportunity to lay eggs, they may be able to at least hold it to the area where it is or eradicate it over time if they're successful. So the problem with invasive species is that typically they enter a new area without their natural predators and parasites. So they come in, they find themselves in a new environment and they're just trying to find anything they can that's you know, what they're used to in their native range and some are going to be successful, some are not. Some populations will build rapidly and unchecked. Sometimes they can be here for years before we even determine that they're present in the United States. Um, they can heavily target a certain crop or a plant. Um, sometimes it's structurals or other commodities. And they can cost millions of dollars in eradication and containment methods. You know, if you think about the, the insects that I showed you and the wide amount of um, area that some of them cover, you know, and you think of every state where they they're running surveys and they have inspectors on the ground um, putting out traps. The traps are, you know, the traps cost money. You've got to pay people to do this. Um, sometimes there's treatments and insecticides uh, involved that people are paying for. And so it gets extremely expensive very quickly to, to um, keep some of these things in check or to try to eradicate them. Um, and again, like I mentioned with some of these others, some of these invasive species will affect plant movement. So, you know, when plants are shipped off across the country, especially in the spring for the growing, new growing season when homeowners want to go out and buy new plants and put them in their yards and have new plants, um, that's when we find most of these things moving. Um, commodity movement happens all year round. This is going to be things like grain moving or uh, just anything coming in from other countries, uh, whether it be, you know, marble, artificial Christmas trees, arts and crafts products, fruits and vegetables, cut flowers. There's so many things that come into our country from overseas that it's hard to get a handle on all of it. So, um, you know, some, some of these things are gonna be long-term or permanent uh, problems bringing in invasive species. Um, others are just going to be a more temporary, uh, like a seasonal thing, like I said, like horticultural plants, um, decorative plants. So we've talked a lot, and I know I've mentioned a lot of these uh, groups already, but there are a lot of uh, entities or groups out there tackling these invasive species. So one is the USDA APHIS PPQ, so the United States Department of Agriculture Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. Uh, plant Protection and Quarantine Group. We also have the state plant regulatory officials. In every state, this is the equivalent to either a state entomologist or a state plant protection person or and their group of inspectors in their office at home. There's also the National Plant Diagnostic Network, which is made up of five different regions throughout the country. And then there's Bugwood. Um, and at the end, I have references and um, websites for all of these if you're interested. So we're going to first talk about the USDA APHIS PPQ. Uh, they inspect plants and materials entering the United States. Um, like I mentioned, at the ports, um, 
sometimes the Department of Homeland Security works with them as well, since um, initially when the Department of Homeland Security was formed after uh, the attacks in New York in uh, 2001 on 9-11, um, most of those uh, people who were part of, who became part of the Depart new Department of Homeland Security came from the USDA APHIS PPQ. So about half of those employees that made up that new department for Homeland Security came from the USDA APHIS PPQ. Um, they will also inspect plant materials leaving the United States. When they do that, this ensures that we as the United States don't send an invasive species to another country that does not have something that we have. So when they do that, they go in and they look at the commodities. Um, there is a manual that tells them what they have to inspect, how much of it they have to inspect. And then they issue what is called a phytosanitary certificate saying that this product was inspected on a such and such a date. Sometimes a country has an import entry permit that they have to follow. And that is going to tell the inspector doing the inspection what they have to look for and how many they have to look at before they will allow that into their country. Um, they do survey work for delineating surveys. So anytime there is um, the, the emerald ash for, sometimes they're out there setting traps, like I mentioned at the beginning, um, on the exotic leaf rollers. They're setting traps and looking for things, hoping they don't find it. Um, another survey that goes on is the National Honeybee Survey, and Kansas participated in this in 2017. And when we took all of these samples of honeybees and sent them in, they looked for things like varroa mites and diseases of bees. But another thing they were looking for was an Asian honeybee mite. And by looking at all these samples from 31 different states, they have been able to determine that we don't have this invasive species here yet. So they can very confidently say, we don't have this. So sometimes they do what we call negative surveys where they're looking for something that we don't even think we have here, but we're looking for it anyway, just to make sure that we don't have it. Uh, delimiting surveys, we talked about that already with the uh, uh, spotted lantern fly. Um, they also help slow the spread of invasive species, either by doing some of these surveys or by setting up barriers, um, additional traps, things that are going to catch the insects or kill the insects before they can get out of the area. The USDA also does a lot of education to the public in distributing materials about invasive species. One of their biggest campaigns, like I mentioned earlier, has been the burn it where you buy it and don't move firewood um, campaign. And then like, it, like I mentioned earlier also, eradication work if applicable, if it's a small enough isolated population. We have a history of say capra beetle has been found in, the Cal in California back in the 1950s. They are, were able to contain and eradicate it and we have not had a, a, an established population of that capra beetle that stored product pests since that time. The National Plant Diagnostic Network, also known as NPDN, um, you can go to their website at npdn.org. This is a network of university plant pest diagnosticians. And it's not just entomology diagnosticians that identify insects, it's also plant pathology diagnosticians and plant or weed ID diagnosticians. So like we mentioned, the invasive species come in all types. Um, these extension diagnosticians get a lot of samples in from people wanting to know what the problem is, what the pest is, um, and they identify these things. We also work with the state regulatory official, which would be like your state entomologist. That person is known as a SPRO. It's the state plant regulatory official. That's what SPRO stands for. And the federal officials, these are usually USDA APHIS PPQ folks that operate within each state or have jurisdiction in a state. They are known as a SPUD, the state plant health director. So if you do find an invasive species in your state, there is a whole protocol that these folks follow and they practice it. So it's much like saying, okay, we're gonna pretend a homeowner brings in a sample to the lab, you identify it, it's not known to occur in your state, now what do we do? And so they go through the whole protocol of sending this into the lab um, in Beltsville, Maryland, that then 
gets it to the appropriate identifier for most of our insects, those identifiers are actually at the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. And so they will do an official diagnosis. Um, then they send back what the official ID is and it goes to the diagnostician, to the state plant regulatory official and to the federal official. And if it's something that has never occurred in the state before, they then kick off a series of um, steps to determine then, you know, the, the inspectors go out and they start sampling. How widespread is it? Is this an isolated incident? They collect official samples that then get sent off for ID to make sure that they match what the homeowner or the farmer or the horticulturalist brought in um, initially that set this off. And then they they work together and they come up with a plan and okay, what's our plan for the next few months, for the next year, for the next several years? Is it something we can eradicate? Um, and they, they do this on a regular basis if this um, becomes a problem in their area. Um, another good resource for invasive species information is the Bugwood Wiki. Um, so here you have uh, two different uh, websites with Bugwood. Bugwood is related to the national IPM centers and um, also works a little bit with NPDN. Um, they're based out of uh, University of Georgia and it's part of their extension um, programming down there. So there's Invasipedia and then there's www.invasive.org. And so they have one site site for insects and they have other they have another web link that's very similar but then will take you to plant pathogens and other um, invasives. So Invasipedia houses information on invasive plants, animals and pathogens and especially how best to manage them. So if you come across one of these things, this is one resource that's going to tell you how to manage an invasive species. Um, so it also works with the Nature Conservancy's Global Invasive Species Team and the Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health. Um, and it's part of that Bugwood Wiki. It's a really neat site. So here are some uh, screenshots I took from invasive.org. So you can see um, over here on the left, it'll have the name of the invasive species, the scientific name, um, what family it's in, what order it's in. And this one is uh, definitely, I got it directly off the insect site. But then I, we talked about spotted lanternfly earlier. So it gives you an overview, the origin of the insect, its life cycle, its distribution and other things. So it'll tell you then if you have this, sometimes you know what you need to do with it, um, how to contain it, what kind of controls there are. There's a lot of information on these pages. So it's a really neat site. So um, as I'm coming to wrapping this up, you know, in Kansas, we have the Kansas Department of Agriculture. It's the Plant Protection and Weed Control Program oversees most of our invasive species issues. Um, there's their website. And the purpose of that program, and I copied this right off of their website. So the purpose of their program um, is to protect the state's native and cultivated plants from introduction and outbreak of harmful plant pests, including insects, plant diseases, weeds, and other organisms. They provide inspection and certification services. So those certification services are going to be things like those inspections for phytosanitary certificates or other types of certificates that are required to prove that your commodity, your animals, or whatever have been inspected and are free from pests to ensure that there's compliance with statutes and quarantines um, in other states or other countries. Um, actually, when we talk about those phytosanitary certificates, there is a state phytosanitary certificate and a federal phytosanitary certificate. The state certificate is for movement of things between state. Um, and I can tell you um, from when I used to do this kind of work that if somebody moved from this area and wanted to move to California and take their house plants, they are required to have that inspection and take that certificate with them. Um, but then if we're moving commodities to another country, then you add, uh, issue a federal phytosanitary certificate. Um, it also helps manage pests of regulatory significance within the state. So those pests are the things like the Japanese beetle, the emerald ash borer, those things that I mentioned that we kind of look in your, some of your collections for once in a while. 
but they also set up traps, they do monitoring, and they do a lot of other work in the field. They also ensure that plants and plant products and seed are offered for sale in Kansas to meet the requirements of the Plant Pest Act and the Kansas Seed Law, Noxious Weed Laws, and Commercial Industrial Hemp Act. So these are all of the different legal acts that they follow. And so not only when we bring in things like seeds and plants, there's also noxious weeds that can come in on them, different seeds from different weed species, the insects, the pathogens, and a lot of other things. So they cover a lot of different types of invasive species um, at that department. And just to give you an idea, this is the list of Kansas pest surveys for 2021. And you can see I've highlighted the insect ones that they're currently working on. Brown marmorated stink bug is another one that is a plant pest if it's out in your garden or you know, in your trees in the summertime. But in the wintertime, this is another one that becomes a structural pest and tries to get inside to overwinter. Um, emerald ash borer we've talked about and gypsy moth. Um, spotted wing drosophila and walnut twig beetle. Walnut twig beetle is actually one that carries a disease called geosmithia and it causes um, walnut trees to decline and die if they get this disease. So there's a the twig beetle that carries the disease that actually kills, kills the tree more quickly than the beetles themselves would. And then you can also see things like pine wilt and phytophthora and kernel bunt. These are diseases that they're looking for. So there's a lot of different things that they're actively working on every year. So what should you do if you think you found a newer invasive species? So first of all, if you think you found it, there's a couple of places that you can check with. You can check with the Kansas Department of Agriculture, um, call them and send in a sample if needed. You can also uh, talk to a diagnostician at Kansas State University. We have an insect diagnostician and a plant pathology diagnostician and a plant ID person. Um, so you either talk to the entomology department for insects, the plant pathology department for plant pathogens, um, or the biology department for the weed and plant identifications. Um, if it's a new species to Kansas, that protocol that I talked about earlier with NPDN where they practice it, this is the protocol that they will follow. So if a diagnostician says, ooh, this might be a high risk type thing, they immediately let the, the state entomologist and the state um, federal uh, APHIS PPQ person know. They'll say, I'm sending it off to the official lab in Beltsville, Maryland for identification. And then that sets in the whole protocol. Um, after identifications and notifications, a plan is agreed upon by the state and federal departments in each state the state entomologist or the, uh, the state plant regulatory official is the person who calls, makes the calls for what they want to see in the state. They are the lead that will say, this is my state, this is what we're going to do. The, the federal co-op person uh, with APHIS PPQ is kind of a cooperator, but usually they make a lot of decisions jointly together and are in these cases, they're usually in agreement with what needs to be done. So that is uh, the information that I have to present to you this evening on invasive species, and I would be happy to take any questions if you have any.